Welcome to Christ the King Lutheran Church, a place of grace where we seek to share the love of God with one another and our surrounding community. He is risen! And I hope that you on the other side of the screen are responding. He has risen indeed on this wonderful Easter celebration, a unique celebration due to everyone will remember this as the COVID-19 Easter of 2020. We ask for your blessings upon your Easter celebration this week and this year and pray that our time apart will be short now as we get to that magic date of April 30th where we can once again hopefully get the all clear to gather and worship God as a family. I hope many of you have missed this gathering and looking forward to celebrate God's presence with you in the community at Christ the King here soon. I want to offer a thank you to Tim and Elizabeth and uh, Melina Bulat here today for uh, looking and making this production, this Easter service, uh, a really high quality one as they brought their equipment in, donating their time and their labor with this. So a big thank you to them for making this Easter service a, a, a great high quality uh, production for you to enjoy at home. So we hope that you can not just sit back. We don't really want you to sit back. We want you to be involved. We want you to participate some way through virtual reality in the worship service today so that you can kind of have this sense of community with us as we seek to praise our God for the great victory that he has accomplished for us all through his son, Jesus Christ. He has risen. Amen.
The sun rises to greet this day. The sun rises and Jesus is arisen. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. The stone has been rolled away. Alleluia. The crucified is risen. Alleluia. Christ has conquered death by the cross. He has come out of the tomb. Christ has risen and will not die again. Death has been swallowed up in victory. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The, the horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song, and, and he has become my salvation. Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power. Your, your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. You have led in your steadfast love the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them by your strength to your holy abode. You will bring them in and plant them on your own mountain. The place, O Lord, which you have made for your abode. The sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. The Lord will reign forever and ever. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. 
the horse and the rider he has thrown into the sea. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in the fellowship of our altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, in word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty, Almighty God, God, have mercy upon us, us forgive, forgive us our, our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As I called and ordained to Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, by the glorious resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ, you destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light. Grant that we who have been raised with him may abide in his presence and rejoice in the hope of eternal glory. To the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The first reading for the resurrection of our Lord is from Acts chapter 10. Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly understand that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not to all the people, but to us, who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is from Colossians chapter 3. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God.
The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 28th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, o Christ. Christ. We make confession of our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the dead, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ on this Resurrection Sunday. He is risen, he is risen indeed. Amen. Our text for this morning's meditation is from John chapter 20, verse 18, and reads as follows. Mary Magdalene came, announcing to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. Please join me in prayer. Father, we give you thanks, O Lord, for this great victory over death that you worked through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. O Lord, but in order for him to be resurrected, he had to die, and that death had meaning for us as well, as it was a moment of sacrifice, a moment of atonement for our sins. But thanks be to you, O Lord, that you did not keep your Son in the grave, but raised him up from the dead, assuring us that his victory now becomes our victory through our baptism and our connection with him through the means of grace. In your son's name we pray, amen. Well, friends in Christ, I have been told I have to make an announcement today. I'm a little hesitant to make announcements in church because you know what happens with church announcements. The moment you say the word announcement, many people's minds just get lost. They start thinking about getting to their cars, doing activities at the home, what else they have to do with tasks, because most of the times, announcements are not relevant to them. And so when you make church announcements, unfortunately, it goes into the human mind to the bottom of the pile, later to be dismissed. I read a story once about how a pastor had shared his travails with announcements. He was putting in the newsletter that the church fellowship dinner was to be held on such and such date for about three or four weeks. And then, on the Sunday that the fellowship dinner was to be held, he announced it before church started and after church started and even prayed for blessings upon the church fellowship dinner. And then, as he was greeting people on the way out of the sanctuary, one of the parishioners asked him as he shook his hands, is the church fellowship dinner still on for today? That's what happens with announcements. They become so mundane to us, and we just shut things off when we hear that word announcements. I even heard that before I got here, Christ the King Lutheran Church had problems with announcements. They were debating and discussing and arguing over the relevancy, the placement, and the length of the announcements. There's just this bad history with announcements. I've even thought about buying this T-shirt from Amazon for our church secretary. Emblazoned on the words is, it's been in the bulletin three weeks. We struggle. No wonder we have those deprecating chants about announcements. Announcements, 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 a terrible way to die, a terrible way to die, a terrible way to be talked to death, a terrible way to die. Announcements, announcements, announcements. But on this Easter, we remember about an announcement that was made on the first Easter. It was an announcement made by angels to women, and then women made it to the disciples. You've got stories of the resurrection in the four Gospels. You got them from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's fascinating when you look at the four comparisons about the announcement. That in Matthew and in Luke and John, you have the disciples hearing quickly from the women about this announcement. And they share it with great fear and joy. Fear because they really don't know what this announcement means for the world but joy because of what it means for their personal lives. But Mark is different. Mark has another angle on this. Most scholars believe that Mark ends at verse 8 of chapter 16, where it read that the women ran away and fled from the tomb, for astonishment and bewilderment had gripped them, and they said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. And that's how the Gospel of Mark ends? The women share not the announcement? Or maybe they do. Maybe what Mark is trying to say in his text 
is that the women said nothing to anyone as they were on their way to share the news with the disciples, share the announcement, because they didn't want to be delayed by casual conversation on the road. That's a good positive way to say it. But Dr. Volz, he had a different angle on this. In my PhD intensive classes, he memorizes the book of Mark in this presentation of Mark that he and other uh, theologians and scholars and professors do at the seminary. And he was quoting Mark 16, one through eight from memory for us. And I remember how it impacted me as he said the closure of Mark saying, they ran and fled from the tomb for astonishment and bewilderness had gripped them and they said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. And then he looked at us again with piercing eyes and say, wouldn't you? Maybe these women were a little scared. Maybe they were not uh, sure of making sure they made the announcement correctly. Maybe it was the wrong time, the wrong place, maybe the wrong manner. And so they said nothing to anyone. I can relate with that. I remember a time, it was my first year in the ministry, and it was my first death I needed to handle. It was a tragic one. It was the death of a beautiful four-year-old girl. She was hit by a car as she was crossing a street. The aunt came running to my house and said, Taylor's been in an accident, Taylor's been in an accident. And I jumped into my car, ran 20 miles to the hospital, went to the emergency room, not knowing what was with Taylor at the time. But when I got there, I was told that she had died. And then I sat in that emergency room, waiting room with her father. And I was just stunned like he was. He was so stricken with grief, and I was so stricken to figure out how could I make an announcement that would be effective to this man, that would lift him from grief, take away some of his pain, and give him some little hope and comfort? And I was just paralyzed. I just didn't want to make the announcement because it might seem like it might have been the wrong place at the wrong time. And you know, when those two things are wrong, more than likely you're going to say it the wrong way. The grandmother was there. She was trying to, control her, trying to console her son. And she was getting really frustrated with me being so silent as the pastor. She screamed at me, make the announcement, make the announcement. I just couldn't make the announcement. Wrong place, wrong time. More than likely it would come out the wrong way. This was a Good Friday moment. It just didn't seem right for the announcement. Maybe the grandmother thought that making the announcement at that time of grief would have the same result as what the announcement did for the women who went to the tomb on that Sunday morning. They were approaching the tomb with grief, anguish, and pain. And when they got to the tomb and heard that announcement, those emotions were replaced with joy and hope and comfort. Maybe the grandmother thought that the announcement would hopefully change the emotions of her son. Well, let's not give these women too much credit though, because this was not the first time they heard the announcement. They were just like other human beings, sinful like we. They had heard this announcement before, but they had shut it off it wasn't anything relevant to them. And the announcement that they heard before was spoken this way by Jesus himself. At the scene where Peter was making confession of Christ, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus blesses Simon for such knowledge, for it does not come from human flesh and blood, but is revealed to Peter by his Father in heaven. And Peter then is told, along with other disciples, and I'm sure some of those women were there, about what this meant. Jesus said that the Son of Man will be betrayed and handed over to the chief priests and Sadducees to be crucified and die. He will be raised again on the third day. But they didn't hear that last part of the announcement. They heard the first part 
and it didn't fit with their scheme of things. They were thinking of glory and pleasure, and Jesus' announcement starts off with pain and humility, and so they shut off. They don't listen to the last half of the announcement. He shall be raised from the dead. But then on this Easter Sunday, this first Easter Sunday, they hear the announcement again, and this time it impacts their lives. And so we see in this narrative, in these stories, that this announcement that I am called to make today sometimes has to be said over and over and over again. It's just like any human announcement in the newsletter or scroll that we call it here. You think if we just place it in the scroll one time, people are going to pay attention to it? No. We need to keep the announcement before the people over and over again so people just don't discard it. And that is the same thing with this announcement from the church today. And I think the church understands the need for repetition about this announcement. For the church has set aside eight weeks of its year to focus on the announcement because the church knows how the sinful mind works. It easily forgets. There's a story that was shared with me about this cowboy named Tom Mix, cowboy actor. He was one of the best, I understand. And one day he was interviewed by this lady named Adele Roger St. John. Apparently she was one of the best reporters back in those days in the early 1900s. It wasn't her cup of tea, but every other reporter had unfortunately not been able to make the appointment, so her employers sent her to interview Tom Mix. And it was very long as they got into the interview, Tom Mix asked her, do you believe in God? She shrugged her shoulders saying, oh, I, I'm not sure, I don't, I don't think so. Because in her memoir, she really tells us that she learned life from the bottom of the barrel. She learned it among the gamblers, among the prostitutes, among the pimps, and among the scum of the world. It's hard to find God in the scum of the world. And yet Tom Mix gives her a testimony and a witness. He quotes a line from Ezra Pound, who writes this poem about St. Peter, saying these words, I have seen him eat of the honeycomb, since they hanged him from the tree. He's referring to the time that Jesus eats fish and coats it with honeycomb after his resurrection. You might remember it. It's in John. He comes and has breakfast with his disciples. He appears before them, and he eats with them. Now, from what we understand, it all St. Rogers, Roger St. John's didn't really understand or let that thing sink in. But it's curious that you begin to think something must have changed her. Maybe that conversation with Tom Mix, because that memoirs I just talked to you about where she talked about where she got the education of life, guess what she titled it? She called it The Honeycomb. Life eventually changed. The announcement eventually impacted her. And so that's the funny thing about announcements. And even with God made announcements of this news on Easter, it has to be repeated. It has to be repeated in times of joy, lest we forget. It has to be repeated in times of despair, lest we be destroyed. And it has to be repeated in different styles and methods for it sometimes to be effective. Maybe it has to be said by different people. I know as a pastor I'm supposed to make this announcement, especially on a day like this. But there's people that really are called to make the announcement in their situations in life who can maybe be more effective than the pastor. About a week or so ago, I received a text from one of our parishioners, Carl Goss. He has shared with me in his text that one of his co-workers experienced a tragic loss. 
his wife died in birth complications. And I texted Carl back immediately, I'm so sorry to hear that. Let your no friend, your coworker know, I'm willing to help in any way I can. I so wanted to share the announcement with him. Carl texted back and said, don't worry, Pastor, I already shared that you'd be willing to do that because I know that's how you work. But he said, I already shared with him the hope you shared with me through the writings of your book. And it began to hit me that at the moment that the announcement shared by Carl was probably more effective than the announcement made by a complete stranger. Carl knew him. The announcement lies in the word, not in the person. And sometimes that word is enhanced by the relationship. Carl's announcement was just as effective and probably even more effective as if the announcement were to come from my mouth. So we have this announcement, and indeed it is a struggle in the midst of death and in the midst of loss to say it. One of the most struggling times of proclaiming this announcement <clears throat> is at committals. We go, as a group of the survivors, to the, to the grave. And at the very end of the committal, the pastor is called to make the announcement. And those who are of the faithful know that the response to that announcement is indeed. In every funeral, most funerals, I make the announcement and I get no response. And I sit and wonder in frustrations as sometimes I'll throw my agenda into the car and say, what good was that announcement? Did it make a difference in their lives? Did it lift, lift them from pain or from grief in the moment of their sorrow? What difference did it make? Because they didn't make the announcement back. And then it occurred to me, I just simply have to remember these words of comfort. That yes, indeed, though man-made announcements may be a terrible way to die, God-made announcements are a beautiful way to live. And so here's the announcement. He is risen. And your response? He's risen indeed. Did you miss it? Well, don't worry. The church will be making that announcement for another eight weeks. And more than likely, you'll catch it. And if not, I'm sure if you ask for an extension, you'll get it. In his name, amen. And now, may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Rejoicing in the resurrection of our Lord and sharing in his peace, let us pray to the Lord on behalf of ourselves and all people as they have need. Congregation responds to each petition with the word, hear our prayer. O risen Savior, set free our tongues to confess your resurrection before a world still captive to sin and death. Give us courage to go to every place and to speak in every language, the salvation won for us upon the cross and the hope granted to us of life that death cannot overcome. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O risen Savior, make us to burn with the fire of your love that we may love you above all things and love our neighbors as ourselves. Deliver us from fear and relieve the anxiety of our hearts that we may live out fully the hope planted within us and the new life we received in the waters of baptism. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O risen Savior, anoint the words of those who preach to us your gospel and open our ears to hear with faith all that he has done to save us. Raise up many who will serve you in the various callings of your church and who will serve us in your name with your word and gifts. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. O risen Savior, hear us on behalf of Donald, our president, Greg, our governor, the Congress of the United States, and all state and local elected officials. Guide them according to your word that their labors for our nation's health and welfare 
may not be a vain, nor forgetful of the vulnerable, aging, and unemployed. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. During plagues and enemies that threaten, and a world filled with conflict and terror, give us wise leaders, O Lord, that we may be preserved from harm. Bless all military, especially Ethan, Landon, Trevor, Jared, and Tanner. Protect also essential emergency and medical workers, especially Jason and Lee, who defend and help us here and abroad. Protect us and remove our fears. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O risen Savior, across our nation, so many are imprisoned. Bless all prison workers, that they may be humane and serve with integrity. Bless those incarcerated with hope for the future and amendment of life. Help them to serve their sentences with patience and trust in you, and bless their families who dearly miss them and love them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O risen Savior, hear us on behalf of those who cry to you in any need, especially the sick, as we lift up to you this day Matthew Jones, Darren Root, Chris Harrell, Shirley Martin, and Lance, Pat Metzel, Gary Williams, Carla Cates, Charlie Bell, Kelly Landry, Ray Jorgensen, Larry Fetch, Ben Landry, and Claire Halamka. Also the suffering, the disabled, the wounded in spirit, those who suffer with mental illness and the anxious, such as Sharon Shannon McKenzie, and the grieving, such as the family and friends of the mother of Karen Chalant, and others in their last days on earth. Give them grace according to their need and sustain them in their afflictions the day when their sufferings will be exchanged for glory in the life to come. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. <clears throat> o risen Savior, accept the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving from our lips and the tithes and offerings we bring. Increase in the hearts of your people delight in your mercy, gratitude for all your benefits, and eagerness to support the mission of your church. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O risen Savior, give comfort and certainty for those who long for your supper and believe your Son's holy testament, that they may know that they have what Christ says through his word, forgiveness of sins. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, you've inspired people to labor in your kingdom. Continue to grant to the people who serve on the board of trustees and social ministry and outreach of Christ the King faithfulness in serving you and lead them to respond to your love by devoting themselves to seeking and doing your will. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we thank you for Chester and Sandra Tarasco and for the 46 years of wedded life they've had together. Our prayer is that you will continue to bless them, that their testimony of love and forgiveness be a help to other couples as they start their own journeys into married life. Lord, we pray that you will honor their commitment to each other and to you by granting them many more years of happiness together. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. O Lord, be with those who are unemployed or underemployed, especially Kelly and Karen Chafant, because of this crisis. Give to them basic shelter for themselves and for those in their families, and help us to assist them and others in bodily needs. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All praise to you, dear Father in heaven, for you've opened to us the way to eternal life in the resurrection of your Son. Give us now cheer and hope with the announcement that our Redeemer lives and we too shall be resurrected and glorified to live with him in his kingdom. Through the same Jesus Christ, our resurrected Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our, our Father, who art in heaven, heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come thy, thy will be done. done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You see the benediction of our Lord. Lord bless you and keep you. Lord make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you. Lord, lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Amen.